Hello, everyone. It's very nice to see you all here. Have I got the microphone working properly? Good. Excellent. I'm slightly anxious about the technology. Um, it's great to see a room full of um, keen, enthusiastic mathematicians. At least I hope you are. Um, so, uh, as Julia said, I'm going to talk about prime numbers. So, my, my background, my kind of mathematical interests um, are, to, to some extent, in number theory. So, I'm interested in properties of whole numbers. And that sounds quite simple because whole numbers are just whole numbers. But what I hope to show you um, over the course of this talk is that there are lots of really interesting, quite deep questions that you can ask about whole numbers, even seemingly simple, very familiar whole numbers. There's lots to kind of explore and investigate. Um, so maybe it's a good idea to start by being really clear about what a prime number is. So I'm sure you've all come across uh, prime numbers, but let, let's be clear about the definitions. Definitions are important in mathematics. So what is a prime number? It's a whole number bigger than one that's divisible only by one in itself. And the first thing I want to stress is that one is not a prime number. Um, not because of some interesting philosophical discussion about whether it has one factor or two factors or its only factor is one and one. None of that. It's because part of our job as mathematicians is to make good definitions, to make definitions that lead to interesting mathematics. Definitions don't arrive on stone tablets. We make the definitions and it turns out to be a better definition to define one not to be a prime number. Um, so having got that, that straight, let me uh, tell you about the second thing I want to tell you about, which is that two is a prime number. Um, Mathematicians are good at looking for patterns. Um, so you've seen my first two facts. You may have guessed how the rest of this talk is going to go. One is not a prime number, two is. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about two being a prime number, of course, is that it's the only even prime number. So um, if I take an even number that's bigger than two, then it's divisible by one, it's divisible by itself, and it's divisible by two, so it's not prime. So there are all sorts of situations where somehow two is a slightly special case. Yes, it is a prime number, that's really important, but also it's the, the only even prime number. So sometimes it's, it's good to sort of separate, deal with two separately. Um, let's have a look at the prime numbers. So I've coloured them in this nice shade of blue. It doesn't quite match my shirt, unfortunately. Um, so very familiar 10 by 10 grid. I've just coloured in the primes. And the thing I like about this is that as a mathematician, I look at this and I start seeing all sorts of patterns. I start wondering, I start asking questions because there are all sorts of interesting things to pick out there. I don't care really about what happens in the numbers up to 100 because I can see what happens with the primes up to 100. There they are. What I'm interested in is if I can see a pattern here, will it continue if you like, sort of beyond the bottom of the slide, if I manage to fit more rows in here, would those patterns that I'm seeing continue, or is it just some feature of small prime numbers? So what I'm trying to do is look for patterns, but then seek to see, can I, can I see, will that continue? Can I prove that it will continue? Can I show that it won't continue? So here's an example of a kind of pattern. So some of these columns seem to have no prime numbers in at all, right? So here's the, the four and the six and the eight and the 10 columns. They seem to have no prime numbers. There are no blue numbers shaded there in the numbers up to 100. Of course, we just said that 2 is the only even prime number. And all of the numbers in the 4, 6, 8, and 10 columns are even, so we know they're not prime. And in fact, 2 is the only prime number in this column. So that's not the most difficult example, but it's, it's an example of something that we can see here. Oh, look, these columns seem to be empty, seem not to have any primes. And we can be confident that that, fe that kind of feature pattern is going to continue beyond. Um, so there are other kind of similar things. So for example, five seems to be the only prime sitting in this column. It's rather sad by itself at the top there. And we might wonder, does that continue? And you think about it for a moment and realize, yes, it does. That five is the only prime in that column. I can see a few nods, which is great. So all of the numbers in that column are multiples of five. If you're a multiple of five, you're bigger than five, you're divisible by one and by yourself, but also by five, so you're not prime. Same kind of argument. Um, what else? Well, there are sorts of things. There are, there are things about gaps between primes. There are things about where they're distributed. All sorts of questions to investigate. Um, one of the questions that seems to me really kind of important is, if I continue this grid, will I keep getting more and more prime numbers? Or at some point, do I hit a biggest prime number? So there's two kind of very different worlds you could imagine there. So in one world, there is a largest prime number. And after that point, all of the numbers are not prime. They're divisible by some smaller primes, but they're not prime. Um, in the other world, no matter how far down the grid I go, I keep finding more and more primes. So sort of try to get a little bit of intuition about this. I mean, if we look at the grid, the primes are becoming a bit more spread out, right? So there's this gap 
from 73 to 79 to 83 to 89. Then there's this really big gap to 97. It looks like they might be becoming more spread out. That sort of feels intuitively plausible, right? If you take some very large number, like a number this big, it's going to be quite difficult for this number to be prime because there are lots and lots of smaller primes that might divide it. Well, it's quite easy for 7 to be prime because there aren't many things that could divide into it. A number this big, there are going to be loads of things that might divide. So it sort of feels plausible that the primes are going to become more sparse, they're going to become more thinly distributed. But it's sort of, I mean, that's just sort of an intuition. That's not going to pin down, is their biggest prime, is there not a biggest prime? Um, I can't use a computer to help with this. I can ask a computer, please go and look for very large prime numbers. I mean, that's not a totally crazy thing to do. It takes a computer quite a long time to do it. But, but the trouble is that's still not going to answer the question, right? My computer is going to keep churning and, okay, it's found a very large prime number. But I've got no idea whether that's the biggest prime number or whether if my computer keeps going, it's going to find another one. So, so asking a computer, go and look for big primes is never going to resolve the question of, is there a biggest prime number? So we need to do something um, more mathematical to get to the bottom of this. And this is not a new question at all. This question goes back more than 2,000 years. So this was known to the ancient Greeks a very long time ago. And this is a theorem. This is uh, a mathematical result we can prove to be true. So it's no, no longer that kind of intuition. We can prove that there are infinitely many primes. There is no biggest prime number. And um, proof is really important to me. As a pure mathematician, I really care about proof. I care about this certainty of being able to prove something not beyond reasonable doubt, but just completely, utterly certain that something's true. So I want to share this proof with you that goes back to Euclid. Um, so I guess some of you have come across Euclidean geometry, maybe, named after Euclid, who wrote about it in his books, The Elements, more than 2,000 years ago. But he also wrote about other things like number theory. Um, properties of prime numbers, for example, and so he, he gave a proof. And his plan was, was to use this kind of thought experiment. So this is a mathematical technique called proof by contradiction. My guess is that perhaps a few have come, you have come across it, but lots of you haven't. So let, let me try to describe this proof to you. So he said, very roughly speaking, let's pretend for a while. So secretly we think that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Let's imagine that we're in a parallel universe where there are only finitely many prime numbers. And let's see what would be the consequences of a world in which there are only finitely many primes. And it turns out you reach an absurdity. You reach a thing that can't happen. You reach a contradiction. So that parallel universe can't exist. That there must be infinitely many primes. So he said, OK, so in a bit more detail, he said, well, suppose there are only finitely many primes. That means we can write them in a list. Right, my, it might be a very long list if there are lots of them, but there are only finitely many. So I get a very large piece of paper. I write all the primes in the world. So my list starts 2, 3, 5, 7, all the way up to P, the largest prime number, whatever that largest prime number is. And here's a, Euclid's fantastic idea. He said, multiply all those numbers together and add 1. So I don't, I don't know what this number is. This is just a thought experiment, but it's a product of all the primes in the world plus one. And the thing about this number is it has to have a prime factor, right? Because every number bigger than one has to be a prime factor, perhaps have a prime factor. Perhaps this number is itself prime. Perhaps it's divisible by a smaller prime. But it has to be divisible by a prime. So let's think about what that prime number is. Can it be two? Well, no, because this number is two times some stuff plus one. Right, so it leaves the remainder 1 when I divide by 2. It's not a multiple of 2. Can this number be divisible by 3? Well, no, because it's 3 times some stuff plus 1. So it leaves the remainder 1 when we divide by 3. Can it be divisible by 5? Well, no. same thing. Oh, right, so for each of the primes on our list, it can't divide this number because Euclid's built this number so that it leaves the remainder 1 when you divide by any of them. It's not exactly divisible by any of the primes. And this is where we hit our contradiction, right? We've got this number that has a prime factor, because every number has a prime factor, but also it doesn't have a prime factor because it's not divisible by any of the primes in the world, because we know what they are. They were on our list. None of them divide this number. So that's the contradiction. We sort of point where you start feeling slightly ill. You know, this, this just doesn't work out. So, um, so our initial assumption, our supposition that there are only finitely many primes must be wrong. So there must be infinitely many primes. So don't worry if you didn't follow all the details of that, but 
for me, I love the fact that this is a really difficult problem, right? How can we possibly show that there are infinitely many primes? We can't do it by writing a list of bigger and bigger primes. So we need a clever idea. And if you approach the problem in the right way, if you say, well, what would happen if there are only finitely many and so on, then you end up with this really rather elegant proof. So, so for me, this is quite exciting. Somehow, I think the world would be a much less interesting place if there were only finitely many primes. Because in principle, we could write a list of all of them there. There would be, let's move on with it. This way, we know there are infinitely many of them. We're never going to run out of new prime numbers. Um, OK, why am, I, why am I excited about prime numbers? Um, mostly, I'm excited about prime numbers because they're really intriguing, because they are difficult to understand, because they seem simple. I love the fact that. It's quite easy to define a prime number. We all sort of know what they are. But then it, you can ask really difficult questions about them. But another reason that I care about prime numbers is that they're kind of the building blocks from which all numbers are made. So this is another theorem. This is a really important theorem. This is so th important that it's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So the, the clue to its importance is in that fundamental theorem. And it says that every positive integer, whole number bigger than 1, can be written as a product of prime numbers in an essentially unique way. There's just one way of doing it. What do I mean by essentially unique? Well, if I give you the number 12 and ask you to write it as a product of prime factors, perhaps somebody over here writes it as 2 times 2 times 3. Perhaps somebody over here writes it as 2 times 3 times 2. I think we'd agree that was the same, it's the same list of factors, right? It doesn't matter which order I mean, uh, write them in. So that's what I mean by essentially unique. So this is, this is unbelievably important, but somehow it's terribly easy to take it for granted. I'm, my guess is that when you've been at school, sometimes your teacher has asked you to find the prime factorization of a number. It probably never crossed your mind that the person sitting next to you might come up with a different answer. But the fact that they won't is somehow really important to all sorts of more sophisticated mathematical things. So the first property that you can just write every number as a product of prime factors is important, but maybe not so subtle. The subtlety comes from the uniqueness of prime factorization. So um, there have been some uh, work in generalizing number theory beyond the integers. So we can do number theory with whole numbers. We can ask about properties of those. It turns out there are some generalizations of that where you can try to do similar, similar kinds of things. Um, this is something that uh, mathematicians got really excited about in the 19th century, trying to prove Fermat's last theorem. So perhaps some of you have heard about Fermat's last theorem. This is a problem that goes back to the 17th century. If you don't know about it, you should look it up. It's a fantastic story. Um, really old mathematical problem showing that there are no solutions to a particular equation. In the 19th century, mathematicians started to get very excited because people started to say, well, look, if we don't just work with the integers, we work in these generalized settings, we can prove Fermat's last theorem. Unfortunately, somebody then later came along and pointed out it just doesn't work because in some of these generalizations, you don't have uniqueness of factorization, um, which was a blow, but on the other hand, uh, there's been a century of really exciting number theory coming out of, oh, this doesn't work. Instead of getting cross, throwing in the towel, it doesn't work, going away, let's try to understand why it doesn't work. What's going on? What's special about the integers that means this works? So I'm not going to prove this result for you right now. Um, not that it's a massively difficult thing, just there are other things that I want to tell you about. Um, but it is a really important thing. It's worth being aware. This is a thing that needs proving. It is not completely obvious that if I take a number this big, that I can write it in as a product of prime numbers in just one way. I sort of clear with 12, because you can try it. 12 is one. If I pick an arbitrary very large number, it's not clear without proving the theorem. And incidentally, this is quite a good reason to define one not to be a prime number, right? Because if one were prime, then officially, 12 could be written as 2 times 2 times 3 times 1 times 1 times 1. And officially, that would be a different factorization. And that would sort of be silly. So, so this is quite a good reason to say, let's define 1 not to be prime. OK, so prime numbers are important because they're the building blocks from which we can make other things. And that means we can use them to solve problems. So sometimes I want to prove something about all whole numbers. If I can prove it for prime numbers, then I can use the fact that the prime numbers are the building blocks to sort of build up to proving it for other numbers as well. But also, they're just really intriguing of themselves. And talking of intriguing, I want to tell you about my mathematical pencil. Somebody gave this to me. I wish I could remember who. Um, a few years ago, they just said, oh, Vicky, have this pencil. I think you'll like it. And I said, oh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pencil. You know. um, and then I looked at it a bit more carefully, and I discovered it had some numbers on. You can't see the pencil from here, so I took some photos of it, which hopefully are here. 
This is slightly grubby pencil because it's in my pencil case. It comes everywhere with me, just in case. You never know when you'll need an emergency maths pencil. Um, so my pencil has a hexagonal cross section, right? So there's six sides. That's what these six photos are. And the person who gave it to me didn't explain the significance of the pencil. They just said, Vicky, have this pencil. Um, so I was looking at it thinking, what's going on? OK, so it's got some numbers on. That's kind of interesting. Um, it's got some black numbers. It's got some red numbers. Um, I realised the numbers kind of spiral round the pencil, so I'm not sure how that easy that is to see from the photos, but it starts with the side with one, and then two, three, four, five, six, and then it goes back to seven on the same side as one. Okay, so the numbers kind of spiral round, and some of them are black and some of them are red, and I thought, that's interesting, what's going on? And then I looked at the red numbers and thought, oh, I recognise these numbers. These are my old friends, the prime numbers. Oh, that's very nice. Somebody's given me a pencil with a prime number, so that'll be handy. If I want to check, is 79 prime? Instead of having to work it out, I'll check my pencil. Um, and then I thought, well, actually, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, these photos are not very clear because they're photos and it's a grubby pencil. So I typed up the numbers for you. Um, but in order to fit them on the screen, I had to tip them vertically, OK? So the, the first horizontal photo is now this vertical column. So I hope it sort of makes sense of this. So there's the six um, sides of my pencil in those six columns. And the thing that really struck me was that there seemed to be some sides of the pencil with no prime numbers at all. And then these sides just had two and three, being poor, sad, lonely primes, the only primes on that side. And then there were a bunch of primes clustered on the others. And of course, this is like my grid from earlier. I don't really care about the numbers on the pencil because I can check the pencil. I care about what happens if I had a much longer pencil. It wouldn't fit in my pencil case, but what would it tell me about the distribution of prime numbers? So if I continue this, if I go far enough, will I find some primes on those sides? Will I not? And I thought about this. I thought, actually, this four and six column, I've seen these numbers before. These are even numbers. I already know there are no even primes apart from two. So two is the only prime on this side, these are all even. There are no primes here or here. Great, fine. What about three? So I guess on this side of the pencil, all the numbers are multiples of three. So these numbers are all multiples of six. These are all the odd multiples of three. Of course, apart from three, there are no multiples of three that are prime, right? If you're a multiple of three, you're bigger than three, divisible by one, and by yourself, and by three, so you're not prime. So three is indeed sad and lonely. So then I realized what this pencil was telling me is that apart from two, or three, two and three, every prime number is one less than a multiple of six, or one more than a multiple of six. Isn't that nice? I thought that was quite good for a single pencil. So apart from two and three, every prime number in the world is one less than a multiple of six, or one more than a multiple of six. Oh, well, that, I thought that's good. I thought, well, before I put this pencil away, actually, now I've got lots more questions I want to ask. I want to ask questions like, I know there are infinitely many primes. We saw Euclid's proof, there are infinitely many primes. There are these two here that are special cases, but apart from them, I've got infinitely many primes split between these two sides of my pencil. So are there infinitely many that are one less than a multiple of six and infinitely many that are one more than a multiple of six? Or does one of those sides only have finitely many? You know, how do the numbers in these two columns compare? And what would happen if my pencil had a different number of sides? What would happen if I had a pencil with seven sides or 100 sides? Would I get this same kind of phenomenon of primes bunching up in certain columns? Or would there be infinitely many primes in those columns? And there's so many questions that, that you could go on and investigate. And actually, they, they all turn out to be really interesting questions. Um, there's, there's lots to unpick there. Um, but let's not do that right now. What I want to talk about right now is how many prime numbers there are. And that's a stupid question, because we already know the answer is infinitely many. But here's a way to make it a sensible question. Um, I can ask how many primes there are up to a certain point. How many primes there are there up to a million, or a billion, or a squillion? So I tried to get a sense of the distribution of the primes. So I know there are infinitely many. I said before, this sort of intuitive idea that they're becoming more spread out. But how? How fast are they becoming spread out? You know, if I go up to a squillion and then up to two squillion, how many primes are there between a squillion and two squillion? Are they mostly up to a squillion, or are there quite a lot between a squillion and two squillion? Squillion is not a technical term, I hasten to add. Um, so this turns out to be a really good question. Um, so mathematicians invented some notation for this. So we write pi of x to mean the number of primes up to x. So 
pi over 100, I showed you that grid earlier. There were 25 primes on there. Check. Don't believe me. You should never believe anything. You should check it for yourself. There are 25 primes up to 100. So pi over 100 is 25. Um, this is the Greek letter pi. You're all very familiar with this Greek letter pi from stuff about circles and things, trigonometry. There's lots of interesting things about pi. This pi has nothing at all to do with that pi. OK, this is just a letter. It could have been p of x or f of x or something. But for reasons lost in the mist of time, some mathematician somewhere decided it was a good idea to call it pi. So now the convention is to call it pi, so I have to call it pi. This has nothing at all to do with circles. It's just the name of a function that says, how many primes are there up to x? So back in the um, 18th and 19th century, mathematicians got really interested in understanding the behavior of this function. So how fast does x grow as a function of x? So there are, there are x numbers up to x. How many of those x numbers are prime? And the thing I like to remind myself when I'm thinking about this is the technology that the mathematicians in the 18th and 19th centuries had available to them. Uh, if they wanted to know how many primes there were up to a million, they did not Google it. <laughs> Uh, they did not uh, hope that somebody had done this calculation before. They did not write a little computer program. They got out their piece of paper and they got out their pen or whatever and they jolly well calculate it. And you have to check, you know, which of these numbers are prime. And I'm kind of humbled by the amount of calculation that these mathematicians were doing in order to start to make some predictions. I mean, it's very hard to have any guess about how does this function pi of x behave unless you gather some data. And gathering data meant doing lots and lots of calculations and doing them right. I mean, you don't want to get that wrong and think this number's prime when it isn't because then that's going to, to mess up your data. Um, so great mathematicians like Gauss, Riemann, kind of mathematical heroes of the past, were working on this, were coming up with conjectures and there became this really famous problem to prove that pi of x is asymptotically equal to x over log x. I will interpret this for you in a moment. This became um, one of the kind of big problems. People were very excited to try to prove this. And then right at the end of the 19th century, 1896, 1897, about then, um, two mathematicians, Adamar and de la Vallée Poussin, managed to prove this. And this is a kind of highlight of 19th century mathematics. Um, proving the prime number theorem. Let me try to make sense of this for you. So uh, my guess is that some of you have come across logarithms and some of you haven't because it tends to come up in A-level, but it depends which order you do the topics in. So don't worry if you haven't. Um, but if you have, when I write log here, I mean the natural logarithm to the base E, which you probably write as LUN, um, but for reasons I don't understand, people who work on this bit of number theory, in fact, lots of pure mathematicians in general will write log, meaning learn where you write learn. I don't know. Anyway, it's the natural logarithm to the base e. This twiddles thing, this looks a little bit, you know, what does that twiddles mean? It looks a little bit alarmingly is approximately or something. That's very vague. I'm, I'm a pure mathematician. I like precise statements. This is a precise statement. Officially, this says pi of x is asymptotically x over log x, which means pi of x divided by x over log x tends to 1 as x tends to infinity. Great. What, the way you should think about this is that pi of x grows like x over log x. So it is a sort of is approximately equal to, but there is a precise meaning. So it's not just, oh, it's about this. There is a technical kind of sense for, for what this thing means. So there are x numbers up to um, x. About x over log x of them will be prime. And this is, this is an asymptotic thing. It, it gets better for large values of x. If you want to know how many primes there are up to 100, jolly well work them out and count them. If you want to know how many primes are there are up to a billion, 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 this is a reasonable estimate. Okay, So it, it's a better estimate for larger values of x. Um, there are, so what Anamar de la Vallée-Poussin proved was that pi of x is x over log x plus an error term. And then you show that this error term is somehow much smaller and less important. So um, if we could prove the Riemann hypothesis, which is one of the most famous kind of unsolved problems in mathematics, we would get better information about this kind of approximation, about that error term. So we strongly suspect that better things are true. This is conjecture, a thing that mathematicians believe to be true but can't yet prove. Um, proving the Riemann hypothesis would be a really good way to understand that. Um, the Riemann hypothesis is great. I'm not going to tell you about it right now because there are other things. To understand the Riemann hypothesis properly, you need to know some more kind of technical mathematics. And I'm not going to try to do that in the next minute. Um, 
there are things that we know. There are, there are problems on which mathematicians have made progress, like the prime number theorem. There are problems that are still unsolved, like the Riemann hypothesis, like a better um, asymptotic estimate of how pi of x behaves. Um, let's go back to the primes, because I want to talk about another famous problem. So I showed you this before. These are just the primes on our familiar 1 to 100 grid. And um, I said before, the primes are sort of becoming more spread out. There were these gaps, 83 to 89, 89 to 97, it's a big gap. This is a complete con, right? If I put another row on this slide, you'd have seen that 101, 103, 107, and 109 are all prime. OK, so the next row would have had lots of primes bunched up all together. On average, they are becoming more spread out. The prime number theorem tells us this. When you unpick the significance of this x over log x, it's telling us that they are becoming more spread out. But there do seem to be these instances of primes that are still bunched up close together. And I mean, if we look at this grid, there are some examples here. We can see 17 and 19, uh, 71 and 73, 59 and 61, 107 and 109. These are pairs of primes that differ by just two. So. A very natural question somehow. We know there are infinitely many primes. Are there infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by two? I don't know how old this question is. I mean, the origins of it seem to be lost in the mist of time. Maybe Euclid, maybe the Greeks asked themselves this question. They, they might very well have done. Um, I don't know. But the thing is, nobody knows the answer. So this is called the twin primes conjecture. Conjecture. We think it probably true, we don't have a proof. So the conjecture is that there are infinitely many pairs of these twin primes. So there are some sort of plausible reasons to believe that it might be true, um, like you get your computer to go and look for very large primes, and there are some very large pairs of primes that differed by just two that we know about. As I said before, that doesn't prove anything either way, but it at least reassures us that we do seem to keep finding these. There are some heuristic models of the primes. So there are some ways of saying, well, the primes behave approximately like this. And if you unpick the consequences of that, you can predict that there are infinitely many twin primes. You can actually make predictions of how many pairs of twi twin primes there should be up to a million or a billion or a squillion. That's not a precise, that, that, that's a heuristic. It's a, a, an idea. It's, it's based on the primes are a bit like this thing. It's not a proof that that's how the primes actually do behave. There are, there are plausible reasons for making this conjecture. None of them are a proof. It would be possible for somebody to turn up and say, actually, it's not true. I've disproved it. Um, I'd be surprised, but it's possible. Um, but I don't want you to think that, that these problems get posed and then they never get answered. Right? The prime number theorem did get addressed at the end of the 19th century. And there's been some progress on the twin primes conjecture just in the last two or three years. So I want to tell you a little bit about that, because um, this is really exciting development within the world of mathematics. Mathematicians are very excited about this. So about just over two years ago, um, a mathematician called um, Yi Tang Zhang, based in the States, not famously a world expert in the area, you know, he wasn't a, a hugely eminent mathematician, published a paper in which he showed that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most, by at most 70 million. Um, the thing is, we're aiming for infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by two. And... 70 million is quite a lot bigger than two, right? I mean, there's sort of, OK, there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by most 70 million. What of it? But the thing is, this was the first result of its type the mathematicians have been able to prove. So 70 million is much bigger than two, but it's a lot smaller than infinity, right? So, so this development was um, a big news. So mathematicians start writing to each other, emailing, saying, oh, have you seen this paper? This is really exciting. And it became clear looking at his paper that he'd taken some recent work by other people. He'd added his own clever ideas. The kind of technical perseverance he needed to make this paper work was astonishing. But there were little points in his argument where if you did this calculation in a different way, you could get a better answer. If you used a bit of computer help here, you could improve on this bit. If you applied this recent idea somebody else has had, you could improve on the argument. You'd make that 70 million smaller. So 40 years ago, what would have happened would have been mathematicians around the world would have got hold of Zhang's paper, 
and worked on making little improvements. And they might have worked by themselves, or they might have worked in little groups of two or three, saying, oh, how can I improve on this little bit? And then there'd be this kind of flurry of papers. Some say, well, I can get it down to, I don't know, 69 million. And somebody else say, well, I could do a little bit better. And every now and then there would be a big jump, and somebody would miss out because they were they, you know, sort of scooped by somebody doing more than they could do, getting their first bit of a race. And that's not what's happened this time, thanks to the internet. So there's this new way of working that some mathematicians have been um, looking into involving collaborating online. So um, it's called polymath. So the first, there's a joke in there somewhere. The first polymath project was started actually by Tim Gowers, who's based in um, maths here in Cambridge. Um, so can we have this kind of massive online collaboration? Can we, by working together in public, on blogs, on wikis, solve a problem? And I think sort of, to a lot of people's surprise, possibly to everybody's surprise, the first polymath project managed to solve a genuine research problem that mathematicians have been working on for some time in a surprisingly short period of time through this public collaboration. And then there were several more polymath projects. And following Zhang's announcement that he could prove there were infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 70 million, it became quite natural for somebody to say, well, let's have a polymath project. Let's work on this together. So there's no rule that says you can't sit in your office by yourself and work on it, but there was an invitation to anybody who wanted. You don't have to be a professional mathematician in a university department. You could be anybody to get involved in working on this problem of, can we make this 70 million smaller? Can we get closer to two? And so this started up a couple of years ago, this month, and over the summer happened. It's all still there. It's all online. You can go and find it. It's all on blogs. It's all on wikis. It's in the public domain. You can see the process of people trying out ideas. There was a kind of leak table of, you know, Zhang's got 70 million. Well, somebody would come along and say, well, I think I can get this by doing this bit of the argument. And then somebody else would come along and check and say, yeah, this looks great. Tick. Or actually, I think there's a problem with your argument here. You want to take another look at that. So it's kind of checking each other. So there's a league table of this number dropping and dropping. And it's really exciting. And you know, progress is happening really fast in public rather than waiting a few months for it to be published in a journal or whatever. And by the end of the summer, the Polymath Project had managed to show that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most what, 4,680. And the brilliant thing about this is that you're dead impressed by that because it's a lot smaller than 70 million. If I'd said 4,680 at the beginning, you said that's a lot bigger than two. But compared with 70 million, 4,680 is fantastic, right? There are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by most 4,680. Um, and then progress kind of dried up. Somehow all of those little points where you could just improve a little bit here and a little bit there and so on, it seemed like those had all been exploited. So the people involved in the polymath collaboration wrote up the project, wrote up a paper for publication, and sort of you need a new idea. And what's exciting about research maths is you don't know when that idea is going to come, right? It might be soon, it might take a while. And what happened was a couple of months later, um, a British postdoc, so a young mathematician who just finished his PhD, was working in the University of Montreal called James Maynard. Actually, he's one of my colleagues in Oxford. Um, had a new idea. So he'd got his own work, and he'd looked at Zhang's work, and he'd looked at the polymath work, and he was able to show that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 600. Big drop. Everyone gets very excited because, you know, can we get to two? So the polymath project kind of wakes up and says, well, let's have another phase. Let's take James Maynard's work, and Yutang Zhang's work, and our polymath work, and all of these other things, and see what we can do. And next few months it drops and drops and drops and then it sort of dried up again just over a year ago so to the best of my knowledge the state of the art is that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 246. still not two but pretty good massive progress right in the space of a year and in the public domain so you can see what's been going on and so on which for me is a really exciting aspect of the project um so what happens now? Well, so here's a really good strategy if you're stuck on a maths problem. I, remember, I recommend this to you. If you're stuck on a maths problem, assume that you can do some other difficult maths problem that, in fact, you can't, and then use that to help you. So mathematicians do this all the time. So I mentioned the Riemann hypothesis. There are lots of papers that say, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, then dot, dot, dot. So if somebody comes along and proves the Riemann hypothesis, then we'll know all of these other things. Actually, there are quite a lot of papers that say, if the Riemann hypothesis is false, then dot, dot, dot. So, um, so in the case of uh, the twin primes conjecture, there's, uh, there's this really useful conjecture um, 
called the Elliot Halberstam conjecture. So the Elliot Halberstam conjecture is not phrased in terms of pencils, but should be. So I said on my mathematical pencil that apart from two and three, all the primes in the world are one more than a multiple of six and one less than a multiple of six. And we know there are infinitely many primes in the world. It's not too difficult to show that there are infinitely many primes that are one less than a multiple of six and there are infinitely many primes that are one more than a multiple of six. So then there's this kind of race of, you know, if you're a prime, would you rather be one less or one more? If I look up to a million, how many of the primes are one less than a multiple of six? How many are one more? If I look to, to a billion or a squillion, how many of the primes are one less than a multiple of six? How many are one more than a multiple of six? How do those two options compare? And there's no terribly clear reason why one of them should be more popular than the other, and you do some calculations, and it, it seems to be they're fairly evenly split. I mean, you, might, you won't expect them to be exactly evenly split, but fairly evenly split. So I know that up to a million, there are pi of x, pri uh, pi of a million primes up to a million. So I expect there are roughly pi of a million over two primes that are one less than a multiple of six, and roughly pi of a million primes over two, uh, pi of a million over two primes that are one more than a multiple of six. I expect them to be roughly evenly split. So the Elliot Halberstam conjecture does that for all possible number of sides on a pencil. What happens if I have a 100-sided pencil? Which sides are the primes distributed between? How many of them are there? And then they sh that's not too difficult to answer, but then they should be roughly evenly split between those. So there might be a few sides where there's just one prime, but the, the cases where there are infinitely many, they should be roughly evenly split. If you assume the Elliot Halberstam conjecture, if you assume a strong enough problem that nobody can do, let's, let's be clear about this, then Maynard and Polymath and Zhang and so on leads to better results, like there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 12, or even 6, if you assume enough. So, so one way of solving this problem is going to be to make some progress on the elliott halberstam conjecture. Unfortunately, that seems to be very difficult, but, you know, mathematicians do difficult things all the time. Um, if you only worked on things that were easy, nobody would ever make any progress. Um, so two is going to be really difficult. It's sort of completely clear. There are technical reasons. It's sort of understood to some extent why two is difficult. Showing there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by just two is a really hard problem. But mathematicians are getting a lot closer. And every time mathematicians get a bit closer, we understand a bit more about how the primes behave. We have some new techniques to apply. We can take those techniques and apply them to other problems. We can take techniques from other problems and apply this to this one. Um, so there's lots, lots to keep working on there. Um, you can go home and have a look at the Polymath blog, at the wiki, at the league table, see. You can get involved, right? You might need to learn a little bit more maths before you get involved, but why not? Um, so I thought I would uh, leave you with something to think about as a warm-up before you, before you get to um, proving the twin primes conjecture, because... I've got no idea when the twin primes conjecture is, will be proved. I sort of believe it will be. I, I, I'm inclined to believe that it's a true statement, and I believe that mathematicians will prove it. I have no idea whether that will be next year, whether it'll be in 30 years' time, whether it'll be in 150 years' time. I've got no idea. Maybe it will be one of you. Who knows? Here's your warm-up problem. So uh, I've talked about twin primes, like 3 and 5 and 5 and 7, these pairs of primes that differ by just 2. So 3, 5, and 7 is like two pairs of twin primes glued together, right? There's sort of three numbers with spacings of two each time. So my question for you is, are there any more triples like that? And I think that's a good point for me to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs> what happens if you prove it? Sorry, what do you... Yeah, so nobody's going to come along and say, here's a big fat check or something. Um, so proving the twin primes conjecture will be a really exciting moment. So the person who does it will go down in the history books as having proved this very famous old problem. Um, somehow, mathematicians are very excited when people solve problems, but they're excited by seeing what the solution tells them about more mathematics. So, so what was exciting when Andrew Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem was not so much that Fermat's last theorem was true. I mean, that was great, but, you know, what was exciting was that his proof led to all sorts more mathematics. So the tools that he used to prove Fermat's last theorem have led to a whole kind of industry of mathematicians saying, 
oh, I wonder whether I can take this idea that he had and apply it to this other problem. What does this piece of work that he's done in the course of his proof tell me about this other thing? So there are going to be all sorts of consequences of wh whoever comes up with a proof of the twin primes conjecture, which might be one people, person, one person, it might be some massive online collaboration. Um, it's then going to be really exciting to see what comes out of that. So knowing the twin primes conjecture is true is great, would be great, but it's also what can we do with that? Um, and there are prizes in the mathematical community and it seems possible that the person who proves the twin, twin primes conjecture might get a prize if it's one person or a group or whatever. But it's much more about what does this tell us about mathematics? How can this tell us more about prime numbers? I hope that's enough of an incentive to work on it. Yeah. How do you decide what you're willing to assume? That's a good question. So somehow you want to assume as little as possible. I mean, ideally, you only use things that are already known to be true. The best possible scenario is that you take lots of theorems that people have already proved and you put those together along with your own ideas and deduce something. So you only start assuming other things if you really have to. And I mean, sometimes it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. So people, it becomes clear, if only we knew the Riemann hypothesis was true, we could prove this. Then somebody else might come along and say, well, actually, look, you've had some really fantastic ideas here. That's great. I can see a way to get around that assumption. So, so it's not a disaster to publish a paper where you say, suppose this thing is true. And if you say, suppose the Riemann hypothesis is true and then prove some stuff, and somebody then comes along and proves the Riemann hypothesis is false, that doesn't mean that what you've done is wrong. It just means that you can't use the Riemann hypothesis to deduce it. So, yeah, I mean, when you're doing your homework, you have to be a little bit careful that, you know, you don't assume something your teacher wanted you to do. But um, it, it, it's a, a well-established way to make progress. See, well, what would be the consequences if we knew this? What could we do with that? So when people make conjectures, they usually have some reason for thinking it's true. So when people were counting primes up to a million or a billion or whatever, and then making a, a guess for how that function pi of x behaves. That was based on some kind of ideas, but that wasn't a proof. So you don't just say, well, suppose the following random thing is true, then I can do some stuff. You sort of want to write down something you've got some reasons to think might be true. That's why you come up with a conjecture. So I mentioned there were, there were reasons to believe why the tw twin prime conjecture is plausible, but you don't have to have a proof when you say, when people say, suppose the Riemann hypothesis is true, then dot, dot, dot. That's not because they have the outlines of a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. It's because there's lots of other evidence from other places for why it might be true. But that's not a proof as such. So, yeah. But it's, it's a good question. You don't want to just kind of assume any old thing and then see what would be the consequences necessarily. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the real life applications of proving the twin primes conjecture are currently non existent. Uh, <laughs> So I'm completely unapologetic about this because for me, it's really important that mathematicians, some mathematicians are working on problems because of the intrinsic interest of the problem, because within the context of pure mathematics, making progress in these problems is really important. Of course, there are mathematicians whose work does relate directly to real world problems. I have lots of colleagues in Oxford who are busy working on things that have immediate applications in engineering and biology and finance and so on. Um, but it's really important that we do these things as well because of the unforeseen consequences. So the classic example is cryptography. Um, may maybe you're not old enough to have a credit card. I don't know. So wh when I'm using my credit card on Amazon, buying another exciting maths book, I'm typing in my credit card number. I want Amazon to read the credit card number. I don't want the baddie along the way to read my credit card number because then they can use my credit card details to buy their own maths books, right? That would be a bad thing. So I need some cryptography there. The, the, one of the standard techniques used for encrypting data with online shopping is based on mathematics that goes back to Fermat in the 17th century and Euler a little bit later. They weren't doing it because they were interested in online shopping. They weren't even doing it because of the cryptographic um, applications. They were doing it because they were really interested in properties of whole numbers, in structural relationships about the whole numbers. Centuries later, somebody came along and said, look, this is fantastic. We can take these tools from pure mathematics and apply them. It's very hard to predict what those applications might be or which things will turn out. So maybe the twin primes conjecture in the future will have some application. Maybe it won't, but maybe the understanding developed in the course of proving the twin primes conjecture will lead on to something. So for me, it's really important that some people are doing that sort of blue skies 
pure mathematics just because it's really fascinating, because we really want to know the answer as well as people looking for applications.